Hello everyone, welcome to another GDG Tech Sessions. Um, today we have a special edition with Gus. Um, he is going to talk about machine learning stuff. Um, but first, let me just briefly introduce you um, what the GDG Tech Sessions are. So basically we are a set of online events where we help other communities um, during this period to do this transition between in-person to online events. Uh, and each tech session, we briefly talk about some specific topic. We had already topics about mobile development. We also had about um, artificial intelligence topics and other stuff. You can check all of these events in our YouTube channel. Uh, and yes, anyone can join us, anyone can be part of the team, anyone can suggest new talks. Uh, you just need to reach us in, uh, in the GTG Tech Sessions website, or you can also use our Twitter to, to reach us. And although we are based in Europe, we do uh, these tech, the tech sessions for all the world. Uh, this means that you can join us from anywhere, any part of the world, and you can broadcast also your event to any part of the world. Uh, we are we had already speakers from India. We already we already had from US, and we are expecting to get more speakers from other uh, regions. So this is the team behind GDG Tech Sessions. We had Carlos Silva Abreu. Fernando Nutinj, also we have Rustin and me, uh, your Freitas. Today, as I already told you, we have Gus. Gus is a developer advocate in Google AI, AI team, and he's been working on the TensorFlow Hub and helping the community to, to employ um, AI, AI models um, accessible and easily to any device, for example. And in today's talk, he's going to talk about, you know, these uh, machine learning um, topics are becoming day after day uh, more dependent on like mobile devices. And the transition between um, the, these models from your computer to 
to, to your mobile device can be hard. And um, Gaz is going to explain you how you can do that and easily, and also how you can customize uh, those models. And now I think it's time to call Gaz to the session. Hey, Gaz. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you for, for joining this uh, GDG tech session. Of course. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. So I think now we can start with your talk. Uh, just a quick remind you that you can ask any question. And Gus was talking with me that you can do any machine learning um, question and also, of course, about uh, this talk. OK, Gus, one more time. Thank you for, for joining us. And well, I will talk, I'll talk to you um, after your talk. Okay? Thank you very much, Jogo. See you in a little bit. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, nice. So first of all, as Jogo mentioned, uh, feel free to leave your questions on YouTube. I will try to answer them after the talk. Uh, I prefer easy questions just to make my life easier. So uh, I'm Gus. I work on the Google AI Developer Advocate team. My goal is to help you all learn machine learning and use on your uh, on your research, on your job, whatever you, you need, want to use it and make your life easier. Today, I'm going to talk about how to use machine learning models on device, on Android, to be more precise, and how to customize those models when you need to do that. Uh, and this is, a, this is a task that has been very hard in the past. It got much, much easier. So I'm going to talk about the new tooling that's available. I'm going to talk about uh, how to do things, show some sample code. I hope it's useful for everyone. Let me just arrange my screens here, reset my watch, and nice. So let's talk about customizing ML models for Android. But before we get there, I guess it makes sense for us to talk a little bit why Edge ML is so important. When we talk about Edge ML, we're talking about machine learning happening on the Edge devices or mobile devices or on a refrigerator, on the car, uh, anywhere that's not the server. So this is important information. Anywhere where it's not the server, it also means your browser, right? So we're, we can talk a little bit about that later, but let's talk mainly about mobile phones for now, right? And why that's so interesting, what happened? What changed? Why it's important to know that? First of all, sometimes you need to run a machine learning model and you need a very lower latency or very close to the data uh, interaction. And if you think about the camera, for example, the camera, when you take your camera and take a picture, most of your pictures today, they run some kind of machine learning model on it after you take the picture, right? Sometimes they run that uh, to make the picture better. Sometimes they run that to fix uh, the lightning or fix the white balance. So there's always some kind, most of the time running some kind of ML uh, on your picture. And if you think that, for example, if I take a picture and I need the cloud to run this ML for me, imagine you have to take a picture, upload to the cloud, run something, uh, download it back. That will take a while to, to make that happen. That's not great. And if we think that we also apply this, these transformations to video, that would be almost impossible, right? You cannot keep a frame rate on a video if you're calling a server, no matter how fast it is. So sometimes you need to run the models on the device. Uh, I also, in another situation, you might not even have a connectivity, right? Your phone might not be connected to any network. Uh, so if you're doing a hike somewhere and you take a picture, so now your pictures are going to be bad because you don't have internet, which is a little bit weird, right? Why, why that would be a thing? So running the models on the device allows you to run completely offline. You don't need network connectivity for anything. Your models are running only on your phone. So this is a very powerful uh, assumption, right? You can run things completely on, the, on your phone, completely on device. And this leads you to something else. When you're running everything on your own device, uh, you, it's much better for your privacy. So if I take a picture of my daughter and... I don't want that picture going to some server somewhere for whatever reason. 
just to apply some filter or not even that. Sometimes I take a picture, I just want that picture. I don't want any filters. I don't want this going to any server. I want this to stay local. My camera doesn't need to go to a server for every picture. So uh, when you run things on the device, you can guarantee that there's no third-party servers interfering with whatever, right? Only if I allow it, and then I can say, yes, yeah, I upload my picture to Google Photos. But if I don't, I don't need to. And running your models on the device enables you to do that. And this is uh, this is a key piece of, uh, of on-device machine learning, right? Privacy. So this is very, very important. Uh, Along with these three eight items I mentioned, lower latency, network connectivity, or no need for network connectivity, and privacy, uh, you enable a new generation of products that people didn't even think about it, right? Of course, uh, the earlier you are, the more space you have to explore. And there's a lot of space right now to learn new things, to apply machine learning multiple uh, apps that people didn't think about that would be reasonable or would help. And uh, let me give you one example. There is this app called the Recorder app. And what it does, it's basically an uh, audio recorder. You record what you're saying. That's all it does. And then you can think, oh, the other thing is this app is completely offline, right? Uh, one of the latest updates, it enabled you to backup stuff to Drive, Google Drive. But outside from that, completely offline. It doesn't need cloud doesn't do anything, uh, which is uh, even, <laughs> if you think a little bit, it's even almost weird, right? It doesn't use cloud for anything. No, it doesn't. And what it does, it's audio recorder. And then you think, yeah, audio recorder. Anyone can do that. Yeah, that's kind of true. So what's the difference? The difference is that this is a smart audio recorder. It can do a lot of things. For example, uh, it can, whenever there's an audio going on, you can start recording. It will tell you what's happening in the audio. It will tell you if someone is speaking, if there is a song playing, if there's a dog barking, if there is a siren, if there is all kinds of events going on, it will tell you. Uh, it will also transcribe all everything that's said to text. So you can later... Uh, while you are listening to what you said, you can see the subtitles, the caption for what was said. And given you have you transform this audio to text, you can you have to scroll over it, right? So there's one new one cool feature that they did is that they enable a smart scroll where they find what's the main topic for each paragraph or something like that, and they allow you to scroll and it will show a, a tip like a ship like it, to the side say. At this part, it's talking about phones. At this part, it's talking about computers, you see? So this smart scroll is a super cool feature, and it's using for uh, transcribing text, use, using machine learning, for finding out what's going on in the recording, if it's a sing or if it's someone speaking, machine learning. If to find out the labels of the sections of your text, uh, also machine learning and very advanced machine learning just to be this this one specifically is very advanced because you don't need to do anything you just record all of a sudden you have that that's processed uh, process while it's saving and then you have the information all of this completely offline all of this uh, in a privacy preserving way uh, works offline and it's super fast so this is a very cool example how do they do that uh, to do that, of course, uh, as you can imagine, I work on the TensorFlow team also. I'm from Google AI, right? TensorFlow is a framework to run, to create machine learning models, to run this, to run inference with these models is a complete framework. And of course, TensorFlow has to start since we did a, do a lot of training. Machine learning training requires a lot of data, a lot of computing power, a lot of everything, memory, blah, blah, blah. TensorFlow is very much focused on servers, on running things with a lot of infrastructure, with a lot of resources, because you were doing state-of-the-art research, right? This is top research for computer science. But when you want to run this own device, you don't need some of the assumptions regarding a server. First of all, you have a device that has a limited amount of battery, limited amount of processing, limited amount of memory, lim limited amount of everything. How do you 
transform this framework to run on the device and still be fast enough. That's what TensorFlow Lite does. TensorFlow Lite is a framework to run on the device that can run any, uh, most of the tests, we can talk a little bit more of the details, but can run TensorFlow modules on your device without the needs of a server. TensorFlow Lite goes beyond that because running a, a model on your device is not just getting the model from the server and saving on your phone. You can imagine that some of these models have gigabytes of size. They're not going to run on your phone. They need to be converted to TensorFlow Lite. And when you convert a model to TensorFlow Lite, you are in a sense changing a little bit the model to make it suitable to run on the device. Not all models allow that because some are huge and need a server. But the models I want to run on my device, they, for example, for an image classification, we're going to see in detail soon, uh, we can run that on the device. And that's a much smaller model, sometimes like four or five megabytes of size. And this is completely doable. And TensorFlow Lite enables you to do that, runs uh, on iOS, Android, uh, other embedded devices, runs, uh, it knows how to use your GPU or any other accelerator you have. For example, Apple have their, they have a specific chip for accelerating machine learning. Uh, TensorFlow Lite knows about it and can use it. It can use your GPU, your DSP, which is a, another specific processor you have on your phone to run specific math operations. So TensorFlow Lite helps you with all of that. As of today, we have billions of devices with TensorFlow Lite framework uh, there because one of the apps is using. So if you look at all these apps on this list, uh, all of them use machine, uh, TensorFlow Lite for something, right? So uh, for example, photos can do uh, a lot of details on searching. When you do a search, it can tag things on your pictures completely on device. Uh, the camera, it's not here, but the uh, pixel camera, it does, when you take a picture, in a sense, it takes a lot of pictures and then it meshes all of them together. This process is doing using machine learning, right? That's not only math operations. Uh, it does also uh, white balancing correction and does a lot of other things. Of course, the assistant, assistant is has a keyword detection, has, uh, it can understand what you say. So whenever you say something, it's transcribed. And from there, it takes some kind of action. And also these third party apps, they do stuff. and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of apps already using TensorFlow Lite. Uh, TensorFlow Lite can run models for all kinds of tasks, for example, for text, speech, image, audio, or content generation. All these models can run on your device. And this is uh, a key thing, right? Most of the things you can do on a server now, you can do on the device, your model can run on the device uh, whenever there's a proper need for that. Right. Whenever you run something on a device, you have to think that uh, you have a device that's powerful. By the if you think by by the nineties, right? Nineties, the phone would be the best computer in the planet. But as of today, it's too powerful. But it's not as powerful as a server. So you have to have in mind what you want to do uh, on your phone. Uh, given we know that we want to play with that, let's take a little. Let's take a look on what should. I, what do I need to run some? To run a model on my device. Let's let's think a little bit. I need, in a sense, as of today, three things. I need a problem to solve, of course. Uh, what kind of problem? Do I want to find what's in a picture? Uh, for example, let's imagine you have a gallery app where you can the user can see all their pictures. One thing you can build for this gallery is you can enable a search. So you can search for dog, cat, bird, and your app, your gallery app, can do a search on your local pictures and highlight the ones that have the uh, item that was searched for dog, dog pictures. So this is very, uh, a very interesting use case because first, if you're a gallery app and you request permission to upload all the pictures, the user might say, no, 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 I don't want to upload anything anywhere. And then if you don't have on-device machine learning, you're not going to be able to do search. You, you're blocked. But with on device, you can do search by applying a image classification and getting all the labels that were found for each picture. And then you just do the search uh, for that. So this is one use case. Uh, you have a problem. 
to solve that can be solved by machine learning. Now, the, th the second thing you need is a model, right? So uh, I've been talking about model, model. What's a model? In a sense, a model is a very big math equation that the computer learns by looking at a lot of data that it was given to him. So, uh, for example, if I'm doing an image classification model, I get a lot of pictures and I tell the computer, look, this is a picture of a dog. This is a picture of a cat. And I keep telling that, oh, this is another picture of a dog. So I show a lot of pictures and I let the machine look at all these pictures. And after some time, it will say, okay, I with 95% of chance, uh, I will do it right. And then you can give a picture to tell you there's a dog in this picture. So it can do image classification. So it's this is the process of training. You let the training happen. This training, you generate a, a file, which is a, a model, we call model. And this is what we use to do inference. Inference is when you ask the computer, hey, what's in this picture? This is an inference, right? It's a query. And it will get the image, go over this math equation, and this will give you the result. Oh, there is a dog, there is a cat, right? So these are, this is what a model is. As you can see, I didn't go into too much detail on how, what's a neural network, what, how to train, how do you choose your data. I don't, I didn't go into this detail because this talk is not specifically to train a model, right? I don't want you to learn that at this talk at least. I want to make keep this simple, right? I want you for to look at a model more like a library. I have this library that can detect if there's a dog or a cat in a picture, right? So this is more uh, the vibe that I want to go here. Given you have this model, now you need some lines of code to use it, right? How many lines of code? That depends on the task. We are going to see some examples in a little bit, and then you can decide if it's how easy it is or not. Let's take a look. Let's start by... Uh, getting a pre-trained models, right? Oh, I guess I did something. Okay. Uh, so how do you get pre-trained models? Uh, when you say pre-trained models, let's go back here. I told you model models are the result of a training. You get the data, you give this to the algorithm, to the neural network, for example, it will learn and create a model. This model is what we call the pre-trained model. It was trained, right? Uh, tra pre-trained before, it was trained before you use it, right? So it's a model that can do stuff. And I told you that you need that. Where do you get those? Now, there are many ways. You can go on Google search and search for a model. The problem if you do that is you find a lot of stuff and you don't know how to use them. You have to read a lot of documentation for each one you find. You don't know if they can be used uh, on a mobile device. You don't know the quality. There is a lot of information that if you are beginning on this area, it will be very hard for you to understand or to even grasp the difference, the, uh, the pros and cons for each model. So that's why we have the first tool that I'd like to learn, which is TensorFlow Hub. TensorFlow Hub is a, a repository of machine learning models where you can search, read documentation, see sample code, uh, see uh, there's a, a complete tutorials to use those models. Uh, there's all kinds of models you can imagine with all kinds of qualities. Uh, and the important thing here, the link, uh, the, the site is on tfhub.dev. I'm going to show the link later. But this link that you see there, uh, it, if you click it, it will go to TensorFlow Hub and search for all TensorFlow Lite models. So it's a uh, a direct thing. It, the models, the TensorFlow Lite models we have there, they were already converted to you. Someone or the publisher, or sometimes the community, they get a TensorFlow model, they convert to TensorFlow Lite, they take care of all the details of converting a model. Sometimes it takes more work. Sometimes it's uh, you have to worry about a lot of details of uh, the size of the model, how fast it is, the quality. And then these mods are already converted to you and are published on TensorFlow Hub. You can download them directly. Uh, so you can just go, oh, download and yeah, use it. So TensorFlow Hub is our repository for all these models. We have TensorFlow Lite models. We have regular TensorFlow models for servers. 
We have models for using the browser with TensorFlow.js, and you can use them uh, freely. There's uh, many, many, many models. Uh, I guess uh, this URL here is for only for image classify classification models, right? It's the same idea, but more featured. So you have, for example, a model to detect birds. You show a picture, you tell it's an eagle, it's a dove, it's a whatever bird it is. On the I, I've used that model a couple of times because if you go to that model, if you search for uh, the birds v1 model, one thing you can see on TensorFlow Hub is you can try the model right there. You can just drag an image to the, there's a widget there. You can drag an image to tell you what bird is in the picture. And there was a friend of mine that he posted a, a, a picture on Twitter with a bird. Uh, and he was asking which bird is that? And I said, oh, there's no other way of solving this problem unless dragging here to, to this widget and see what bird it is. And it was correct. Uh, so it, that was a fun use of TensorFlow Hub. You don't need to write any code to do that. Right? Just drag the image, and it's over there. Uh, we also have a fungi. There's some, some other for plants, for landscapes, uh, insects, I guess. There's a lot of models to detect, to do image classification, all available. And those models you can use on your phone, right? You can use locally. And, uh, and then the next question is, OK. I found a model. I want to use the birds one. Birds is cool. How do I use that? Uh, how how hard it is to use that? And that's where we get to our second tool that I want you to learn, which is the TensorFlow Lite task library. The task library is uh, an API for you to run inference on the device. So when I say run inference, is get the model, load, and give an input to this model see the output. That's what you want to run, right? That's the inference. Uh, the, this task library has many advantages. First of all, it's an API that was designed to be used by anyone uh, or for no ML expert. So you don't need to be an ML expert to use this API. You will see, I, I have a couple of examples you can take a look. Uh, and there's another advantage of the task library that is it doesn't do only inference. It does pre-processing which means that when you give an image, it can resize the image to your model because models, they can run, of course, on any image size, but some of them are optimized for a specific one because of, uh, for performance, performance-wise, right? If you run a machine learning model on an image that's 4K, right? That's huge. It will take a while because it's a lot of pixels to look at. While if you just, resize this image to 500 by 500, the model will run much faster and might be, and from the computer perspective, might be the same problem almost, right? They will find the same things. So the test library will do this kind of resizing for you. It will convert the, the image to the proper format that the model expects. Uh, it's also, uh, the test library is also written to be, to have high performance. So it knows how to use your GPU your uh, or your whatever accelerator you have on your device. You don't need to worry much. It's just one flag you define. And it goes even deeper because you can customize this test library. It's comp all of this is open source, right? You can go to their repository, read the code and customize for your specific needs. Uh, the other thing about pre-processing, sometimes, some some machine learning pre-processing and post-processing you things you run before inferences things you run after the inference uh, that are very common to do on a server they are very clunky to do on uh, on device right uh, you, when you do things on the server you're probably running a python code which is very good on dealing with matrices when you try to do that on kotlin for example kotlin is amazing but doesn't have the same uh, uh, dialects to deal with matrices. So every time I had to do some transformations on a matrix to give the image to the model, it was it was weird, right? You look and you say, oh, this I think this can be done faster. And then you can keep digging, digging, and you never get anywhere. So the test lab does that for you already. There's a C. Uh, code behind it that you do as super fast and you don't need to worry about it. So this is a good thing. Uh, 
as of today, the tasks that the task library can help you with are in the vision domain. Visions are when there's an image, right? You can do image classification, object detection, and image segmentation. And then uh, you ask me what's the difference, and I'll tell you in a little bit. I'll show you some examples. And for natural language, natural language is when the input is text, right? So you can do basic natural language or you can do birch natural language. What's the difference when you do basic natural language is something more you expect maybe less uh, accuracy. When you talk about birch natural language, you're talking about state of the art models for understanding text. And they are more complex to use, of course, but the test library hides that for you to make your life easier. And we have the all the classes to do pre-processing of the input, uh, there's some gadgets there. It's, uh, if you know a little bit about BERT, you know that the input is not as trivial as you would expect. The test library will do that for you. You give text, it will run the model for you. That's all you need. And it does also Q&A. So one, uh, there's a, one of the examples, if you go to the website, you're going to, uh, I guess I put the link before. You can create an app that given uh, a text, a long a text, you can ask questions to the app about the text and it will find for you the answer. So this is a Q&A question answering application natural language. You can, of course, customize your own questions and answers and add that to your app, right? So this is a cool, there's a cool uh, reference app that does that, which is super nice to play with. Uh, it's uh, when you do, when you ask questions and it's almost like magic and it's like, What's going on here, right? So it's using the Q&A task library API. And, and during IO, we release the audio classifier where you can do the same thing for audio, right? So the input for vision is image, the input for natural language is text, the input for audio is audio, as you expect. Uh, so you can uh, say something, it will tell you, it can have a model that can do many things like uh, classify between speech or singing, or dogs or cats or whatever kind of sound it is. And remember the recorder app I mentioned, like right there in the beginning, it's using audio classifier for to do exactly what I said, to do classification of events on the audio, right? And uh, this is something very new. Uh, there's a lot of possibilities, so it's a good opportunity to learn it. Let's take a look on some examples, right? Imagine. I have this image classification problem. I have pictures of flowers and I want to know which flower it is. Uh, and I have a model that does that. Let's suppose I have a model, right? For all these examples, let's suppose I have a model. I went to TensorFlow Hub, got a model that can recognize flowers. Uh, how do I use that on my app, right? You download that model. There's a button on TensorFlow Hub that's written download model. You download the TensorFlow Lite model. I don't know if they have a flowers model, but just for the sake of the example. And then you write these three lines of code. Of course, I'm cheating a little bit. There is, we are missing one dependency, which is the task library dependence that you put should put on your uh, Gradle file with the dependence. Given you add that, you just need to create a options, which will tell you the number of results you want from your model. So usually you want the highest uh, ranked result, result, right? You can get five results, for example. Uh, so you look at a picture and it will tell the five most probable things that is on that picture. Uh, with that option, you give that to uh, the create from file, which create from file will, the model over there is, uh, your, uh, is the path to the model on your app. Uh, so you download the model, put that on your assets folder and you hear model will be the assets folder path, right? And the context, of course, because you have to load the file, load the file in the context. So it will create a the variable called image classifier. Image classifier is all you need. You do image classifier.classify and give an image, it will tell you what's on that image. That's it. That those three lines of code. That's all you need to do image classification with the task library. And that's it. So you can see that uh, I don't know if you did uh, any kind of on-device machine learning in the past. Uh, it's hard to get easier than this, right? Three lines of code. Uh, let's take a look at another problem, another domain. We did image classification, right? Let's do object detection. 
So what's the difference from image classification to object detection? So object detection is, in a way, it's a harder problem because it, it doesn't tell you what's on the picture. It tells you what's on the picture and where it is on the picture. So uh, instead of on the right, you can see that it, image classification will just return pair. That's it. That's the result. Uh, no matter which occurs pair. Object detection will tell you there is a pair at position X and Y. That's it. In the box, it tells you the box around it, right? It's not only the center. It doesn't tell you the center. It tells you the box around it. You can calculate the center yourself. But that, so you can draw those those drawings. You can see on the picture on the left. That's the kind of thing you can do with the object detection API. And how do we use this API? It might be very complex, right? Because this is a much more complex problem. Well, another three lines of code. This is a little bit different. Uh, you get the bitmap and it will convert to this specific image that the, uh, it's a tensor image, right? And then you get object detector create from file. Create from file is the same idea from the image classification. You give the uh, file path. Uh, the D's over there, sorry, uh, that's my bad. It should be context. Right, this I I copied this from a, from a method in a main activity, so uh, should be context because you're loading a file. So detector is what you use to detect, right? And then you give the image to detector dot detect. It will return a list of boxes, and these boxes are the positions of whatever, right? Fruits in this case, right? So this is object detection. Let's take a look on one last use of task library, uh, audio. So how do you do audio? Audio is uh, an important thing, right? Uh, you record audio, and the thing is, audio is different from image because it's not directional, right? When I'm looking here, I'm seeing like this thing here, right? And that's what I can do inference. That's what I can analyze. And it depends on being to have a proper lightning, to have, uh, doesn't have, any kind of fog around. So image classification is very cool, but has its uh, drawbacks depending on the environment. For audio, it can go from anywhere. It doesn't matter if it's foggy or if it's at the night and you can do uh, audio classification the same way uh, as you would on the day or whatever, right? So this is a, a very cool domain, the audio domain. And what you do here is you get an audio and you classify that into an event. Let's see how to do that uh, using the task library. As you can see, it's more complex, right? It's not the same thing. Well, let me guide you through it. First of all, we have the audio classifier that will create a classifier, almost very similar to what we've seen before. You give the context and the model path, perfect. And now there's some differences here. Classifier can create an audio rec recorder. Why do you need that? Because the model, they can, uh, classify events from audio with a specific uh, configuration. This configuration is learned from uh, by the model when it loads the model. It will learn the configuration. It will learn which kind of uh, uh, bit rate, sample rate, uh, number of channels, all of this, which is a, a very audio specific information. I'm not going to go into detail. I'll give you resources to learn that later. So it creates an audio recorder that can record audio in the proper format. You don't need to worry about it. And then you create a, a tensor. The third line of code there is just to create a buffer to put the recording. And then we create like a thread that will keep listening to the recorder. And all you need to do on the last line is classifier.classify. And that will give you whatever it was in the audio. Right, so there's the other thing about audio is that there's a lot of things happening at the same time. Sometimes I'm speaking, but then there is some kind of uh, hap other sounds happening at the same time. It will tell you, look, there's someone speaking, there's some knocking, there's some papers. It can tell you all of these things and what are the uh, how sh how sure the model is about it. As you can see, like there's not many lines of code. Right, this is very new. It was released in May, so. Uh, lots of cool things here. But there's another problem here. And I promise you, I would tell you how to customize our model. Why would you want to customize our model? I told you TensorFlow Hub has thousands of models for you to use. Yes, those thousands of models are not enough 
for everyone in the planet. Let's say like that. Sometimes uh, the the model doesn't solve exactly my problem. For I told you that you can recognize uh, there's for, for example image classification. Usually they're trained on a data set called called ImageNet. This data set has a thousand classes, a thousand one classes. If you don't care for these thousand classes, but you care only for Android figurines, right? This one, right? This one is not in the data set. So if you show that to any of the image classification models that are on TensorFlow Hub, it will not, it will, might tell you that's a toy, right? Uh, which is not a toy, it's an action figure. So you that so the models that are available will not solve your problem, right? Uh, it will solve some other problem, not exactly yours. Or sometimes you want to do classify audio, but the model on Hub, the, the model, the base model we have there classifies uh, 521 audios. But if there's an audio that's not there, what do you do, right? You what can you do? That's where we have to customize our model. And to customize our model, we have to choose something called transfer learning. Uh, transfer learning, I'm not going to go into details on this graph here because I didn't explain to you neural networks and I guess we're, it's too late for that now. Uh, so the idea of transfer learning is uh, you as an Android developer or as a developer, when you try to learn another computing language, computer language, for example, I knew Java, right? And then, oh, Kotlin is cool, blah, 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 blah. I will go to, I'm going to learn Kotlin now. So you don't start from zero because you know how programming works already. You know what's a loop, what's a conditional, variables, classes, all of this. You know these concepts. So when you go to learn a new language, you bring a lot of baggage with you and you learn faster. So you just specialize on whatever Kotlin has that is different, right? Uh, you forget a little bit about Java uh, columns and long names and boilerplate to learn something different. This is very similar to transfer learning. Transfer learning is you get a module that knows how to classify images, for example, thousands of images. You get this module, you uh, remove a part of it that classifies, that does the define its, oh, given all of the, uh, give, uh, give an image, given all of the pixels, there's a horse here, right? You remove this last part that does makes this decision and you train this, this, this part that knows how to understand an image and you train this on your data set now, on your new data. So if I want to create a data set with pictures of Android figurines, I take a lot of pictures, label them and give this to a model that understands image and explain to you that this is a green Android figurine. There's a blue, there's a, a, a what that's a king and all kinds of Android figurines. And I'll train my model. I'm not going to train from scratch because I the model already knows uh, what's an image, what are features, what are important parts, right? Uh, so it will learn much easier to recognize an Android figurine. I'll get like 90 something percent accuracy or precision on these new images. And then I can get this model and deploy my device and have an app that recognizes Android figurines or any other thing I can think like cars or I don't know, any other thing. So I can customize using transfer learning. And how do you do transfer learning? Well, there's, if you know machine learning, you kind of know how to do it. There's a lot of details. You do some surgeries in the model, remove some parts and blah, blah, blah. But I don't want you to think about this today because I want to show you something called Model Maker. Model Maker is a library specialized in doing transfer learning for you, right? Uh, you give your data set, your data, and you tell which, which base model you want to use, what's the task. It will do a training and it will generate for you one model that's specific for your data and that you can use exactly like the models I, uh, like I was showing with the task library, exactly the same thing. So one thing you can do, for example, you get uh, a birds model over there, right? But I don't want to do birds. I want to do types of horse. I don't know. I don't know if that's a thing, right? Uh, types of horse, breeds of dog. Breeds of dogs better than types of horse, right? Breeds of dog. I can get lots of pictures of breeds of do dogs, different like, and train and replace the model on my app. Just replace, I replace the file, nothing else. 
and it will start recognizing breeds of dog. And this uh, model maker, as you can see, there's a URL you can follow. There's a tutorial. Uh, you can play with that and learn. And how much code do you need to write to do that? Well, for image classification, you might need those five lines of code. I'm cheating because uh, I, there's the data wrangling, right? You have to download the data, put them in specific folders. All of these details I'm not going to go into here. It's all in the documentation. But given you have the data, look what we do. We load from a folder. Oh, again, this code is not Kotlin, right? We're talking about uh, Model Maker runs on Python. You can use uh, Google Colab to do this. You don't need to install Python on your machine. Run this on Google Colab, it's free. You don't need to worry about that. So you data loader from folder will load these images. It will split and train and test data, which is some part for training, some other for you to validate that your training has good results. And then you have the customizer model, which is image classifier dot create. This will, given your training data, train a model for you with transfer learning. The model later you can evaluate with the test data to see how good it is on data that it didn't use. And it, you can get like very high accuracy for basic tasks. And then you export. That export will save this model to a file. That model.tflight, whatever name you give, you can get that file and drop on your Android app and do image classification with the test library. The same way we did with the models from TensorFlow Hub. Right, so this is absurdly powerful. But you said, I, yeah, okay, image classification is easy. Uh, I want to do object detection. Okay, we can do object detection. Object detection has a, a little bit different API because the data that you use is not the images only, right? The data you use is the image and you have for, for an image, you have to tell, draw a box around what you want to, to train on, right? So you have to draw boxes around everything that's important to you. And that's why there's a CSV there. The CSV internally will have something like image URL uh, and then box, label box, label box, label being dog or Dalmatian at this position or I don't know, Cocker Spaniel at this position. So this is that's why it's, it's not an image folder over there, right? It's more than an image folder because Object detection needs more than just images. And then to create a, to create a model, object detector dot create. Boom. How to evaluate to see the uh, accuracy? Model dot evaluate, model dot export. Same API, same thing, right? Uh, last, let's take a look on audio. How do we do audio? Audio is a little bit more complex because uh, remember what I said that audio has different specs. So some audio are, uh, have different sample rate than others, and some details. So uh, we have to define something called model spec. Model spec tells model maker how to deal with the data that you're going to use and how to deal with the base model that you're going to use, right? Uh, let's. So when we tell model spec, there's another thing. For all model, uh, model maker executions, there is a base model. This base model comes from TensorFlow Hub and you can customize it. So for image, you can use, instead of MobileNet, which is a common base model, you can use MobileNet v3, which is much newer, or EfficientNet v2, which is even uh, more, even newer. I don't know if that word exists. It's even more recent, let's say. Uh, for object detection, same thing. You can customize the base model and the different base models can give you bigger models with better accuracy, but sometimes it's slower to execute on the phone. So we have to take that into account. For audio, one of the main base model we have is uh, YAMNet. Uh, and after you define the spec, you same thing for loading the data, as you can see there, we get, but then you give the spec, you give the data directory, and then audio classifier dot create, same thing, and export this model you can use directly. Uh, this is how you do Customization of audio classification model. There is a, if you go onto the model maker URL, this one over there, model maker, we have links, uh, sorry, we have links to all these tutorials with code that you can follow, explaining detail by detail, what you can do, 
how to customize for your own data. So this is uh, over there. Just going back here. So TF Lite has the power. Can TF Lite when we, uh, TF Lite model can come from pre-trained from Hub or from training with your own model, or if you have Google Cloud, they have AutoML that exports model to, for edge execution. Those models will work here the same way. Uh, and given you do that, uh, you'll give to Task Library and it will run for you. So in summary, I know I've been a little bit longer than I, I thought I would, sorry. What you need to learn. On-device ML brings many new possibilities. Uh, if you need to remember three tools to go and study a little bit more about on device, uh, TensorFlow Lite uh, Task Library to run the models on the device. That will make your life so much easier. TensorFlow Hub to find new models or base models that you want to work with. There's a lot of those you can go play along with them. And Model Maker for you to customize your model uh, for your needs. So if you have your data and you want to make a model specific for you, model maker. So if you need to remember things that you want to study later, print screen, this, this is a good one. This is a, I put over there exactly for that. It's still for own device machine learning. We have this new website that uh, was released during Google I.O. We have tutorials for all these domains to run uh, inference, customization of models, everything to run on the device. So g.co slash on device ML. Uh, you can find all this, all this content is available there at, of course, different, different uh, framing, right? But the idea of on device machine learning is completely there for you to learn. There is a lot of code labs, videos, text, everything for you to learn. It's a very good uh, resource for information. Talking about resource, we also released uh, recently the TensorFlow forum where you can go and ask questions to this TensorFlow team is there answering questions. I'm there answering questions. So you get some answers from the people that build those tools or from the community. The community is also answering questions uh, like, like the community is amazing. They, are, they know a lot about things and they post what they build, they share, they help each other. It's amazing. So discuss.tensorflow.org. I highly suggest you create your account and start to interact with people. It's a great opportunity to uh, meet or learn what people are doing, ask questions from professionals, and that's great. And sorry for taking too long, but uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, these two links, tensorflow.org slash light for TensorFlow light information, tfhub.dev for TensorFlow hub, if you want to go look into the model. Again, my name is Gus. I post on Twitter at Gustema. I post content about machine learning and uh, TensorFlow and Python a lot. So if you want to keep up to, to what's going on, what's new, just follow me there, leave a comment, ask a question, let's interact. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot, guys. Thank you for showing us how with three lines of code, you can like build a, a very complex model from, from the scratch. Uh, for those of you who are watching this talk, you can ask questions to Gus. We already have some questions from the audience. Uh, and you can write those questions in the comment uh, box and then Gus will, will reply. So Gus, we are, already have some questions here. I am going to start with Carl Pshidvabriu. He is asking about if there is any other pre-trained models that can be used besides the, besides the ones available. Yeah, so uh, it, there's a lot of repositories. For example, there's one specific from TensorFlow. It's called Model Garden. But the models that are there, they're not they're, uh, provided as to be used with the source code that's there. So it's for more advanced users, uh, way more advanced users, uh, if you want to look into the model and customize some very specific details. and But uh, I don't know of any other repositories of models for TensorFlow. But if you have one from your, for example, in your, in your company, you might have a place where there's the researchers and they can generate models. And you can use those models if they follow the specs on Model Maker, for example, to fine tune later or to deploy with Task Library. So those models would come not from TensorFlow Hub directly. And as I said, you can, for example, AutoML from Google Cloud generates models that you can use also on the device. So those models are also uh, 
would also be available to use with Task Library. Uh, so that's you have more places to find models than TensorFlow Hub. Okay, thank you very much. I, I also can ask one question here. So, I mean, you have those spam models where you can feed new information every now and then. Okay, how you can do that with TensorFlow Lite? I mean, you deploy a model for being using on an edge device. How you up update that model with new data? So, so if you want your model to keep learning, that we don't do uh, on-device learning yet. Uh, this is way more complex for multiple reasons. So the model that's there will do only what you train him it to do. If you need to update, there's some things you can do. First, you can, for example, release a new version of your app with a newer model. That's one option. There's also Firebase model hosting where you can de deploy the model to Firebase and you can download from there. So you could update your model without a new version of your app. This is also possible. Uh, so those are basically the two options we have today. Usually what I've seen people do, but I've seen people do both of them depend on how your company works, right? Sometimes you don't do many app releases. So you put the model on, on TensorFlow on Firebase model hosting. It's easier for you to remotely push new models. But if you do releases every month, for example, you can maybe wait and release a new model. So uh, there's two, these two options. But you cannot customize the model for the user's data yet. Okay. Okay. Probably something that TensorFlow team will work. Yes, but it's it's because the problem uh, it's more complex than just customizing locally, right? There's a lot of uh, things that haps, happens in terms of uh, privacy and blah, 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 that needs to be addressed. So that's why we don't have that yet. Yeah, okay. So we have another question from Rustin. I think he's talking about like how you do benchmarks. I mean, uh, how you can compare different models and try not to decide which one is the best for your application. Yeah, yeah. so there is no good tooling for that. On TensorFlow Hub, we have some tables of comparison of the models. So for example, for MobileNet v3, which is very new, or EfficientNet v2, which is also very new, we have a comparison between, because they have like 40 models there, right? For each one. For different image resolutions, they have different accuracies, but they also have different uh, inference times. Some are, they get the better accuracy, the slower they run, right? Uh, so we have these tables. Uh, but this is taking into account one specific phone. They did a benchmark on a phone. That's it. But that's not the same for every phone. So this is a very, it's a complex problem that there's no easy solution yet uh, to have like a benchmark for all the models at the same time crossed with uh, the phones that you're running them. So we don't have that. For more, for models more, uh, popular, there's some comparisons on Hub and in other places that will tell you, oh, this model is always better than this. They put this on papers, but I, people on this talk, I don't expect to be reading papers because they're, they're not researchers. I don't expect to be a researcher, right? Uh, and uh, it's a different, different uh, audience, I would say. And they read papers. If you're not used to reading papers, it's something from another planet so but they have these benchmarks there right and that's uh, uh it's this is a little bit tricky we have some on hub but it's tricky it's there i don't have a good solution for that yeah, okay yeah and also you need to take care into consideration that you have different devices you have different os's also you have to you know combine all of these and things. different gpu for example for example samsung for their phone, for their uh, S21, I don't know what's their latest phone. Even that phone has many different builds per country, right? Because there is uh, differences for chipset sometimes, for carrier. So even between those phones, the, the, the performance might be a little bit different. So it's not, there's no answer for, oh, the, this is the answer. We don't have that yet. Yet. <laughs> Uh, okay, Rustin has another question here. Uh, he's talking about the audio classifier, if it's able to distinguish between uh, people's voice. Yes, it can. Uh, it should, but you need a lot of samples from each one of those people. With their, I think there's a data set for that uh, that would help you do that. 
You just need to adapt for the for model maker, and you might be able to do that. Unfortunately, Yamnet is not the best model for dealing with people's uh, uh, speech. It can tell you that someone's speaking or crying or or something like that, but it's focused on more short uh, term audios, right? So if you can like a, a shot or a bark or stuff like that, it's better for that. But you can try. Uh, if you have the data set, you can try and it pro you, you can do that. Definitely can do that. The problem is having the data set for this specifically. Yeah. Uh, okay. We have um, the last question. From of course. So what about OCR? Are there any examples that allow us to do inference with Keras? So OCR is, is, a, is, a, is an interesting problem. Uh, we have an OCR API on MLKit, if I'm not mistaken. MLKit is a library above TensorFlow Lite. They use TensorFlow Lite, and they do OCR for you. OCR is not as easy as people think because it's not only looking at an image and looking for text. It does something like object detection, right? But for letters and numbers. So before finding out which letter and number it is, it needs to find where they are in an image, and then it goes and find which letter it is. So OCR, sometimes you run, and it takes a long time for a very small image, and say, why, why, it's, going, why it's doing that? Because it's running on every pixel, and that's uh, exponentially bad. So OCR is a trick problem. There is, uh, we don't have a uh, open, uh, I guess Keras.io, if you go Keras.io, I think there is an OCR example there. Uh, but there is also, ML, if you want to run on device, there is ML kit that does that for you. Uh, it's it, simple API, also three lines of code, four lines of code. Give an image, it will return text. Uh, but that's for not heavy text. If you take a picture of a book page with a lot of text, that's not going to work really well. It's more for, for example, the, this image that's on the screen with is customizing, blah, blah, blah. This would be a, a, the perfect target. But for book pages, needs a specific model. It takes longer. But take a look at MLKit. And Keras.io, they might have examples there for OCR. Yeah, and also needs to adapt the OCR model to the language, probably, because you have... Oh, yeah, yeah, because sometimes we're talking... We are very used to talk about uh, latching characters, right? Or these characters we look here. But for example, for other, for Japanese characters, Chinese characters, those, uh, or any other language characters that are very different, they need a specific OCR for them. And the problem gets more and more complex. Okay, guys, I think we don't have any other question. And we also reaching more than one hour of broadcasting. So I think- I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No took worries. too long. It was really, really fun. And interesting to see your, your talk. I think we can wrap up. Um, and okay, again, thank you very much for accepting our invitation for, for doing this talk. Glad to help. I, ha I have here another question, but it's about like FPGAs. You have these hardware limitations, but we can discuss that in another talk. Um, so thank you very much for, for, for this amazing talk. Nice. Thank you very much for the invite. Thanks everyone that joined. I hope it was useful. Again, if you need, have questions, uh, feel free to ping me on Twitter at Gustema or TensorFlow forum, discuss.tensorflow.org. Uh, feel free to go leave your question. There's a lot of amazing people answering questions there. It's a great way to learn and to get your answers. So feel free. We, we are always happy to help. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes. See you all. Bye bye. Yes. Uh, so for, for the last part of the talk, uh, I'm just going to say that you can check our our talks in YouTube. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Uh, probably by the end of this uh, month, we are going to have a talk about Flutter. So please stay tuned for, for, for the next events. Thank you very much and see you next time.